you probably already own a really sophisticated EQ plugin. So why on earth would you use something like the Pultec EPQ1A, which frankly has a lot less features and a really antiquated 1950s design? This video is sponsored by DistroKid. Follow the VIP link in the description down below to get 7% off an already amazing price to distribute your music to the world. I reckon if you were to just grab a Pultec EQ right now without any background, there's a high probability you'll either end up very confused or completely misunderstanding what's really happening with it. The controls are less than intuitive, but have no fear, by the end of this video you'll completely understand how the most famous of the Pultec EQs works. Not only that, but I'm going to give you not one Pultec trick, but three tech tricks to be going on your way with. In fact, I might add a fourth one towards the end as well. But before we get into that, let's learn about those pesky controls. I'm using the Universal Audio plugin version of this EQ because having tried many of the others, I reckon this one comes closest to the original hardware. Now I'm not going to explain right now why I think that, but I will discuss it towards the end of this video. One thing I can say now is that the controls are laid out in almost an identical way to the original hardware. So at least in that way, it's very useful as a learning tool. And it's really with these controls where most of the confusion or misunderstanding about this EQ comes in. They're not all that intuitive, so let's break them down. The first thing to understand is that they're grouped into three basic groups. The first group on the left-hand side has three controls, and here we can control both the boosting and the cutting of the low frequencies. The next three controls here in the middle control only the boosting of some high frequencies. And finally, in our third group on the right-hand side, we have two controls which only cut or attenuate high frequencies. Now you've probably already got plenty of question marks in your head having heard that explanation. So let's dive in a bit deeper, starting off with the low frequency controls. At first glance, the low frequency controls seem to be pretty straightforward. You start off by selecting a frequency range. You can select either 20, 30, 60 or 100 hertz. I'll set it to 60 for now. And then you can go ahead and either boost those frequencies using the boost control or you can cut them with the attenuation control. Did you notice that I said either or? I'm saying that on purpose because in the original manual it definitely said do not attempt to boost and attenuate simultaneously on the low frequencies. Well guess what? Either somebody didn't read the manual or they thought they'd be a rebel and do it anyway. And that's when they discovered the real magic or part of the magic of a Pooltech EQ. But to fully understand it we need to see what's going on under the hood a little bit. So I'm going to pull up this plugin here. It's called the Bertom EQ Curve Analyzer. It's completely free and I'll put a link for it in the description down below. And here we'll be able to see exactly what's happening. So let's go ahead again and boost those low frequencies. And as you can see, it's quite a wide area of effect. The middle of our boost, which was 60 hertz, is around about, let me find it, around about here somewhere, yeah? But you can see that it's affecting frequencies right up to above 1000 hertz or 1 kilohertz up there, okay? So a very wide area of influence. Okay, let's drag that back down and push the attenuate knob up. So we're cutting frequencies now and quite a similar thing is happening in reverse. I say it's quite similar because it's not exactly the same. You see, with the controls when we look at them, we can see that they're numbered through from 0 to 10. These are just abstract numbers. They don't actually represent decibels at all. In actual fact, when you're boosting the frequencies, you're boosting them by 13 and a half decibels at 60 hertz. 
but when you actually cut the frequencies, you're cutting at something more like minus 17.5 decibels. So there's about a four decibel difference between the boosting and the cutting, right? Now, that's not really where the magic is, however. In actual fact, it's when we use both together. So let's start off again by boosting. So we'll push that up. And what do you think is going to happen when I attenuate? Is it just going to flatten that line out? Well, let's see. I'll push it up. And no, it hasn't flattened that line out at all. It's virtually left that boost intact. I say virtually because it's been affected all the way across the range there. But we can see this fairly large cut down here at around about 530 hertz. Yeah, So it's around about a, over a 6 decibel cut there. Yeah, That's pretty significant and it has a really significant effect on the sound. And this is going to be what we're going to demonstrate later on with one of our pool tech tricks. In fact, the pool tech trick, I guess. So it's worth keeping this in mind. But it's not just with the low frequencies where the magic is happening. Again, with this group of controls, I can start off by selecting which frequencies I want to affect. And here I can choose between 3000 all the way up to 6000 kilohertz. I'll set it to say 4000 at the moment, Maybe I was affecting the intelligibility of some vocals or something. And the only thing I can do in this group is actually boost those frequencies using the boost control up here. So again, let's bring up our analyzer and see what's actually happening. So as I push the boost control up, you can see this nice kind of bell-shaped curve appearing. And the further I boost it, the sharper that curve gets here. So take a look at that behavior as I push it up. Now I can actually smooth that out a little bit using the bandwidth control over here. You can see it goes all the way from sharp through to broad. So I'm just going to push that up and as I make it more broad you can see it kind of smooths that curve out. Now this EQ never gets what you would call surgical but at least with this control we can sort of focus in on some frequencies a little bit more. Now you'll notice with the frequencies that we're controlling that there's a bit of a crossover with our next group of controls. Our final group also affects high frequencies but on this occasion we can only cut them using the attenuation control here. Which frequencies we affect is determined with this control over here where we can select between 5, 10 and 20,000 hertz. And you'll notice with these values there's a bit of a crossover with the controls we had in the previous group over here for frequency selection. And indeed, these bands do interact with each other. But before we look at that, let's just look at this band by itself and see how it behaves. So I'll select, say, 5,000 hertz here, and I'll start to attenuate it. And you can see, just like the low frequencies, we're affecting a really broad range of frequencies here. Yeah, and it acts almost like a low shelf. But it does interact quite a lot with both, strangely enough, the other high frequency controls and the low frequencies. So there's actually a really interesting little dance that occurs between these three bands of EQ. Let's start off by boosting those lows again as we did earlier and then attenuating them, giving us that very distinctive pull tech sort of dip in the low mids there. Then I'm going to go ahead and boost some high frequencies like so. And as you expect, we see this kind of bell curve occur there. And I'm going to move that down to uh, 3000 hertz, OK? It hasn't really affected that dip at all, you'll notice, at the moment. Now, interestingly, if we start to affect our final group here, so attenuating the highs, I'll do that now. And then we move the frequency select back to 5000 hertz we start to st see that distinctive pull tech dip disappear now if i broaden those high that high frequency boost like so then that pull tech dip has almost completely disappeared now i'm not suggesting that this is particularly useful but i think it really demonstrates the really intricate interplay between these three bands of EQ. Now I can replicate any one of these curves um, with a standard EQ plugin, but I've 
found actually trying to replicate the behavior and that interaction between them all gets quite difficult after a while or certainly takes some time with a regular EQ. But more important than that, perhaps, is the nature of these curves. If I put them back to more sort of average kind of settings like so, you can see that as I've said before, there's nothing surgical happening here. These are sort of broad sweeps. So they're not useful for fixing specific problems, like a specific noise you want to get rid of, perhaps some sibilance or a particular noise on your guitar. But they are very useful for kind of sculpting the sound of a source. And that way, they're kind of very musical to use. And I think that's one of the major advantages of this EQ. The pull tech trick or the two knob pull tech trick is actually very, very simple. And because you now understand how a pull tech works, because you watch the rest of this video, you're going to understand why this trick is working. We're going to be using it to thicken up the sound of a kick drum. However, it's also often used on either a whole kit or it can be used on things like a bass guitar, for example. This is the groove that we're going to be working with. Okay, so let's take out that bass guitar and the rest of the drum kit and have a listen to that kick all by itself. So we're going to start off by doing the most obvious thing, and that is boosting the low frequencies. I've got it set to 30 at the moment, but you may want to experiment with 30 or 60, depending on your source. So let's have a listen as I boost those low frequencies on this kick. Okay, so it's definitely got a lot thicker, but it's also kind of out of control in those low mids. We're going to control that, and you may have guessed how, using this attenuation knob here to cut some of those frequencies in the low mids. Have a listen to how this cleans up this kick drum. So it's definitely a lot thicker. Let's have a listen to a before and after. So this is how it sounded before and after and before and after. Okay, so let's go ahead also and make some adjustments to the kind of clicky sound of our kick. I like to accentuate that. So I'm going to do that by boosting some of the high frequencies. Again, you need to experiment with which frequencies you're working with. I'll set it to 8K at the moment, so it's pretty high. Uh, but remember, our area of effect is quite broad. Now have a listen as I push the boost knob up here. And you may also want to attenuate or cut some of the very high frequencies. I'm just going to go ahead and do that now. So I think we've really improved like the thickness and a little bit of the presence of this kick. Again, let's have a listen to a quick before and after in solo before we listen to it in context. So before and after before and after. Okay, so I want to have a listen now to a before and after, but in the context of the whole groove with the rest of the kit in and the bass guitar. So let's start off with before and then I'll switch to after. So with this trick, we're going to be bringing out the presence of an electric guitar in the mix. Now, before I play you the demo and you go nuts in the comments, yes, 
I'm fully aware that this guitar part sounds very similar to quite a famous guitar part. This is just for a demo. It's not a real song, so I hope you'll look past that. Let's just have a quick listen to the part that we're going to be dealing with. Now it's not too bad, but I do want to sort of bring out some of the high frequencies so it really cuts through. It's got a slightly sort of sharp sound to it. Now before I go ahead and just boost the high frequencies, one thing I want to do is attenuate or cut some of the low frequencies just to start off by getting this guitar kind of out of the way of the bass and the kick and things. So I'm going to do that by using our attenuation knob here and let's do that now. So it's a subtle difference, but it is there and gets rid of some of the muddiness. Now I'm going to do the most obvious part of this, which is to boost some high frequencies. Now you need to fiddle around with which frequencies you want to adjust. I've experimented beforehand and I reckon around about the 4K range is good for me here. So let's go ahead and boost those frequencies. Okay, that's kind of what I want, but it's just a little bit sizzly in some parts, slightly annoying. So this is where I'm going to go for the attenuation knob on some of those much higher frequencies. Um, it's attenuating. I've got the setting here to 10. As I said, I experimented with it before. You need to maybe adjust this to some different frequencies depending on your part. But let me push this up and you'll start to hear that sort of smooth things out a little bit. So I'm pretty happy with that. I hope you get the idea from that. Let's just do some befores and afters, starting off with before, and I'll switch between the two. Our third trick is the Andrew Sheps trick. Andrew Sheps is, of course, a well-known and highly regarded engineer and producer. And we're going to be using this trick to help with the presence of some vocals in a mix. Now, I'm not going to be going into lots and lots of details about the whys with this, but I'll just give you an overview of the setup so you can go away and try it out for yourself. And I reckon it's pretty effective. Now this uses parallel compression so of course we're looking at two channels here. The first one in green is our lead vocal and we're doing a send from that to a bus over here in blue and it's there where we have our three plugins a pull tech an la2a compressor and another pull tech and you can see those three on the right hand side. So what's their role? The first pull tech at the top is going to be getting rid of or cutting some low frequencies so we've got the attenuation set up to around about four here and i'm setting the frequency range to 100 hertz here okay so that's the first role of this pull tech here i'm also using it to boost some high frequencies so i've done one boost here at eight kilohertz and you can see we're just really emphasizing the high end of these vocals. We then go into this compressor, the LA2A, and we're going to do a lot of compression with it here. I've got a really high setting on the peak reduction, and when you see uh, when you see this in action in a moment, you'll see that needle moving quite a lot. There's quite a lot of gain reduction happening here. But a really important setting for the compressor at this stage is to make sure it's not 
reacting to the low frequencies too much. And on an LA-2A, we do that by adjusting this control here, this high frequency uh, pass knob here. Now, it's important to understand with these compressors, we are still compressing the whole of the signal with the LA-2A here but it's not reacting as it's listening to the source to the low frequencies so much. It's got a side chain in this compressor and it's cutting those low frequencies before it hits the detection circuit, if you like, but it is still compressing the whole signal. So then we move from here to our final Pultec EQ here and it's pretty much doing the opposite of the first one. In this case, we're gonna be boosting the low frequencies. You can see I've got it set to around about four here or so. And then we're gonna be cutting or attenuating the high frequencies. So in this case, we've got it, I've got it set to 10K and I'm just doing a bit of a cut here, three to four or so. So we're taking out those lows, compressing it, and bringing some of those lows back in and just reducing those high frequencies we boost to. Now the final step always with parallel compression is to then blend all of that in with the original signal. It's not gonna sound all that great by itself, but when you blend it in, it really helps to keep, the, especially the quieter parts of the vocal, up front still. So I'm gonna grab the fader here, play the vocal, and then gradually blend it in. You think I'm selfish Cause I'm not crying The pain you're feeling Now of course we have made the vocal a little bit louder by doing this but it's not just that. What we're also doing as I say is making sure it never gets too quiet or too lost in the mix. Let me alternate between muting this parallel compression channel and then unmuting it so you can sort of hear the difference quite immediately. You think I'm selfish Cause I'm not crying The pain you're feeling Now, before we go ahead and talk about the very quick bonus trick I've got for you, I'd like to remind you, if you're releasing your music to platforms like Spotify, Amazon, Google Play, etc., don't forget to check out the link in the description down below from our sponsor, DistroKid. If you follow that link, you'll get 7% off of your first year of membership. So my bonus trick doesn't really involve adjusting any of the controls at all. It simply involves using the pool tech on your mix, perhaps on your master bus. Without even boosting or attenuating any of the frequencies, we tend to find that it adds a little bit of color to the sound in the form of harmonic distortion. A lot of people, for example, will use it on the master bus. Now, is this harmonic distortion identical with the plugins um, as it is with the hardware? I can't say for sure, it's a little bit up for debate because even if you compare them, probably one piece of hardware may be different to another in what it exactly produces in terms of harmonic distortion. So um, that's a little bit up for debate, but all of the plugins that I've tried at least do add some coloring to the sound. It's definitely worth giving it a go. So you may be asking, can you replicate these pull tech EQ curves using some standard EQ plugin, perhaps your stock EQ plugin that comes with your door or something like Fab Filters Pro Q3? And the answer, uh, having experimented with this is yes, kind of. Well, you can get pretty close if you put a reasonable amount of work into it. But the problem for me comes when you want to change settings, when you decide to change a boost or something with your material, because as we saw earlier, there's quite a lot of interaction between the bands. So replicating the actual behavior of a Pultec EQ 
using a standard EQ plugin becomes really time consuming is what I would say. Can be done, but very time consuming because there is this complex sort of dance between all of these bands. So that's one reason why I think it's possible, but probably not worth it. Uh, the other thing, of course, we've mentioned earlier is the fact that this harmonic distortion is added with a pull tech. Now, of course, you could use another plugin to replicate that as well. But by that time, it really is starting to be a bit of a pain, not great for your workflow. With the pull tech, you could just push a couple of knobs around, job done, you've got the sound you want, move on with your mix. So given that I'm kind of advocating grabbing a Pultec plugin, why am I using the Universal Audio one? So I noticed as I was experimenting with various Pultec plugins and I was comparing the EQ curves that they produced, that they were all actually different. They were all using the same principles, of course, but the curves were not identical. Some of them were quite different, to be honest with you. So I thought to myself, well, which one of these, if any, is close to the original hardware? Now, the problem is, if you buy the hardware new at the moment, I think it's around about 5,000 US dollars. And if you buy a vintage one, it runs into the tens of thousands of US dollars at times. So I don't have one in my studio to compare it with. However, I was able to use a service called Access Analog. Now, with this website, you can actually run your audio through some real hardware that they have, okay? I was able to do that and compare a couple of real Pultec EPQ 1As with the plugins. And what I found was the Universal Audio plugin actually produced exactly the same curves as the hardware. None of the other plugins were exactly the same. So that's why I've sort of stuck with this plugin. Now, of course, uh, harmonic distortion, it wasn't exactly the same, to be honest with you. However, as I said earlier, there may even be variations with the hardware um, in that way. So that wasn't so important to me. So I feel like this is probably the most authentic pull tech experience i'd love to hear your opinions about this in the comments down below so is the pull tech demystified for you now are you going to be using it in your projects have you already been using it in your projects what's your experience with it this is what the comment section down below is for and i love to read it just after i've released a video i thank you so much for joining me today i'm mike and i hope you will.